This first reading is from Whispers from Eternity by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is entitled, O Divine Sculptor, Chisel Thou My Life. Every sound that I make, let it have the vibration of thy voice. Every thought that I think, let it be saturated with the consciousness of thy presence. Let every feeling that I have glow with thy love. Let every act of my will be impregnated with thy divine vitality. Let every thought, every expression, every ambition be ornamented by thee. O divine sculptor, chisel my life according to thy design. And this commentary on the Bhagavad Gita is entitled, God is Above the Law. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. This passage is from the 18th chapter. Nay, but once more take my last word, my utmost meaning have. Precious thou art to me, right well beloved. Listen, I tell thee for thy comfort this. Give me thy heart, adore me. Sorry, is everything okay there? Okay. Is it, it was too loud? Okay. It was too loud. Okay. No, no, it's important. Nay, but once more, take my last word, my utmost meaning have. Precious thou art to me, right well beloved. Listen, I tell thee for thy comfort this. Give me thy heart, adore me, serve me, cling in faith and love and reverence to me. So shalt thou come to me, I promise true, for thou art sweet to me. And let, th and let go those rites and writ duties. Fly to me alone. Make me thy single refuge. I will free thy soul from all its sins. Be of good cheer. Here, Krishna... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Here, Krishna speaks to Arjuna of a higher path than that of formal religious observances, higher than that of fasting, rituals, good deeds, and charitable offerings. The path referred to is that of one-pointed devotion to the Lord. In no way is Krishna belittling those spiritual aspirants who strive valiantly to adhere to the commandments of the law. A path, however, should not be confused with its goal. The ultimate goal of all religion is union with God. The commandments of Scripture provide rules of behavior for people in various walks of life, simply that they may grow from ego attachment toward final awakening in the Lord. <coughs> by abiding by such a commandment as harmlessness, thou shalt not kill in the Mosaic law, one comes gradually to feel his oneness with all life. By following the commandment of non-covetousness, which is not desiring what other people have, one gradually reaches a state of centeredness, of rest in himself. For from such inward peace springs the inclination to probe the inner spiritual depths. By adhering to truthfulness, one develops the discernment to penetrate through clouds of delusion and to understand the deeper nature of things. No one would advise a child to bypass arithmetic and pass straight on to study of higher mathematics. Nevertheless, once he masters higher mathematics, he may lose some of his familiarity with the simple rules of arithmetic. There is a story of two famous scientists, Einstein and Eddington. They were discussing some abstruse point of physics when they hit an arithmetical snag. Finding themselves in difficulty, they called in an accountant to help them. On the spiritual path as well, elaborate attention to the intricacies of outward rule and ritual is an aid only for beginners. 
<clears throat> it serves to keep their minds engaged in God-reminding activities and thereby diverted from ego-active pursuits. Too much fussy attention to detail, however, becomes a distraction as one develops the ability to live ever more constantly by inner divine inspiration. To one living in ecstatic inner communion with God, the lesser rules of spirituality, the deeper purpose of which is only to guide devotees toward such communion, may be a hindrance instead of a help. It isn't that at this high spiritual level one can steal, lie, and harm people with impunity. Rather, the more centered one is in God, the more his actions are in natural harmony with God's law. He needs no special instructions or formal observances to guide him toward mental alignment with that law. The important thing to understand here is that there is a higher purpose to religious observances. The commandments are not rules to follow merely to please God. Rather, they were given to man to help refine human nature, thereby to make it a fit vehicle for the manifestation of soul consciousness. Outward observances are meant to develop and not to obstruct the ability to love God and to live in true, heartfelt charity toward one's neighbor. That is why Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The souls he had come to help were ready for this higher teaching of divine love and charity. Some of them indeed were ready also for the highest teaching, that of inner communion, directed toward ultimate union with the Lord. To these true disciples he spoke individually and in depth. What others he taught in parables, only hinting at higher teachings with the oft-repeated words, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Sri Krishna also followed the above passage in the Bhagavad Gita with a warning not to share this highest teaching, the call to divine love as the straightest path to God, except with those devotees who would truly understand it and would not use it as an excuse to ignore the commandments of God's law. Moses taught primarily through the law, yet Moses too was a true master. The higher teachings can be seen, as it were, hidden in his life and in the law he gave. Jesus taught the divine truths more openly because in his day people were more generally ready to receive them. In our age, Paramhansa Yogananda no longer needed to have recourse to parables and veiled statements. His great contribution to the history of religion, made possible by people's increased hunger for spiritual understanding, was to present long hidden truths so simply that virtually anyone could accept them and understand clearly, if only with their intellects, to what end the spiritual path is directed. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. Really great to see you. Um, you know, this passage is really one of my most favorites, although it's really hard to have a favorite. But, um, but I just wanted to reread it because there's, as this reading said, there's so many levels of understanding in a scripture and what God has given us in order to have, have God's presence meet us at the different levels that we're willing to uh, receive him in. And so just, nay, but once more take my last word, my utmost meaning have. Precious thou art to me, right well beloved. Listen, I tell thee for thy comfort this. Give me thy heart, adore me, serve me, cling in faith and love and reverence to me. So shalt thou come to me. I promise true, for thou art sweet to me. 
and let go of those rights and writ duties. Fly to me alone, make me thy single refuge. I will free thy soul from all its sins. Be of good cheer. It's so comforting. Krishna, as God, is just pouring his love out. He's telling the devotee how to give him love so that he, the devotee can then feel that love pour into them. There's a circuit that happens. When we give that adoration to God from the heart with sincerity, with deep feeling, then that showers back on us. It's, it's, a, it's a circuit that happens and that circuit amplifies the more we do it, the more comes back. It sounds simplistic, but it, it really works that way. And um, uh, so it's interesting at the end of this, then he says, and let go those rights and writ duties. And Swamiji was talking in the reading about how we have to remember that the goal of religious rights is to find God not the goal is to just do the rites. And so very often, a devotee who's been meditating for a while starts to lose interest in those outer rites that just don't feel deep anymore. They may have come from a place of truth, but sometimes society, you know, requires things to be done, and people just do it quickly to get through it. And they're basically not getting anything out of it. But if, even if you got something out of it, even if while you were doing it, you were doing it with devotion, it's still not the same thing as when you're meditating and feeling that deep inner presence. Now, if you're not feeling the deep inner presence, you, need, you may need to do outward things in order to be, as Swami said, God reminding. These things are to remind the average person of God, not the meditator. The meditator knows that when the meditator meditates, something happens. And for the majority of people, something does happen. For the majority of the people, you read this passage and you can't help but just feel so much love pouring from your heart. And it takes sometimes we're busy with the outward rites. It leaves us no time to go inward. And that there's this requirement to get away from other people and away from their thoughts so that we can be in our own thoughts, our own energy with God. It's impossible really to feel God's presence with bells ringing around your head and people chanting really loudly around you. It's really hard. You know, someone was complaining in a class, uh, the other class is too loud, I can't meditate very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we were a little crowded that day. Um, but it's like, okay, yeah, we, we understand, we agree. You know, when other people are loud, it's hard. It's hard. That's why I always carry my earplugs everywhere I go. And so we have to sacrifice in a way. Sacrifice that continuous time with family and friends so that we can have that time. And wh what better way to be able to uh, solve difficult problems and to think about things creatively and to, um, to just have that inner happiness because meditation allows us you know, that right now in the world, there's darkness happening. There's all the threat of climate change, which is real. There's more dictators uh, in charge of countries right now, 
we're a bit appalled at what's going on in, in our country we're from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he who shall not be named <laughs> um, uh, you know many people have commented on feeling kind of a darker energy these days there's more threat of war right now more tension more fanaticism is happening in countries around the world you know there's a little bit going on here there's a lot going on in our country we're from and then a lot in Europe and I mean everywhere it's happening and then what's this tension we have between Pakistan and India right now so there's a lot of fear in the general atmosphere there's a lot of um, anger going on you know this fanaticism is I'm right and who you are is meaningless as a human because you don't believe what I believe. And so these are real attitudes happening around us. And it's important to do our part, you know, OK. You know, pay attention to the environment, what we're doing to it. Pay attention to disruption happening. Help out with harmony going on around. But the biggest help we can give any situation is meditation, because um, that deep calmness that we get in meditation will help everything and everyone. That deep calmness, we feel so inclined to reach outside of ourselves and try and fix stuff. But if we first pull in and just feel that deep calmness and then act from that calmness, we're so much more effective. You know, we, when we're around people and we're happy, and we're happy because we meditated and felt the presence of God, that happiness and joy is spread to people around us. We have difficult problems, and it's, we usually, when the difficult problems happen, we want to engage with the person and talk it out more and more and more and more until we've convinced them. But what if we instead stepped back, meditated on it, came up with a creative idea that helped everyone in the situation and not just me and mine? These, these are solutions that are born of God contact as opposed to just mentally figuring it out intellectually, you know, A plus B equals C. Therefore, you know, it's obvious what should be done because society has a general way of doing things and we don't want to do things against what society says because what will others say? <laughs> so we have this, you know, push-pull against the rights that we're supposed to do publicly and that inner that we want to do. It's um, just so important to do the inner. And yet, some people are more inclined to be inner all the time, and in fact a bit antisocial. And when they're meditating, they feel nothing. Because they're burned out, dried out, become a twig, dry leaves on the ground, and so then what do you do? You serve. You serve others. But there's the right way to serve and the wrong way to serve. <laughs> if you serve, just, I've shown up, I'm doing it. Give me your name. You know. <laughs> um. But there's so many people who come and serve in such a beautiful way. And that way is hello, welcome, and I mean it. I don't feel competitive with you. You don't feel competitive with me. We are in an environment of acceptance here. I'm a calm person who's been meditating. I am sharing my peace with you. You might not be a beginner walking in the door. That's OK. Then you share your peace with me, too. 
I'm interested in you. Who are you? Wow, maybe another devotee that I've known before in a past life is here now. You know, this interest in another human outside of ourselves, outside of our family circles, you know, so often in, in everywhere you go, people are interested in what goes on in their four walls and not what's going on outside. Here, the neighbors come to us. <laughs> so we're always having to welcome new people. And that's, that's part of the way of Ananda, is to act with interest about others. Swamiji made everybody feel as though he was their best friend. You know? And it was a real thing. And he made sure to make a spiritual connection. You know, there's nothing more satisfying than meeting someone who has a lot of peace, and you don't even have to use words, who has peace and love in their hearts. That's what we're trying to spread, is peace and love in our hearts, not in like a fake happy way or a superficial way at all. This comes from a deep, inner reality that we're all striving for. You know, someone came up to me a while ago, some months ago, kind of wanting to figure out how to navigate Ananda. You know, like, I wonder how I can climb some ladders around here. And, <laughs> and so the question was, what do I have to do to basically become more important here. And I said, no, no, the person said, what is required for me to do? And I said, required? Yeah, what do I need to do and what should I do? Well, this attitude is so different from the people who come all week long serving, who come because they want to come. Not because if I show up, I'll get brownie points. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's, who cares about our brownie points? Doesn't matter. It's not about getting brownie points. It's about coming because you enjoy it. And that's the only reason. Same with coming to satsang. Coming because you want to. We do not have, you know, Step one, requirement number one, requirement number two. It doesn't work that way. That's not the spiritual path. You know, the people that are probably most noticed are the ones who are working the hardest in their meditations and just radiate joy and peace. And it's easy to spot them and you go, wow, something's working for them. Not someone who behaves peacefully or behaves happy. It radiates from the inside out. You can't fake it. You just can't. And everybody knows. You know, it doesn't mean it's not okay to have issues we're working through or to come sad because you need to grieve or work through anger or whatever it is. People come to heal here. So there's no judgment on how people are feeling. But when we meditate, more and more, we have that happiness and joy inside, and that love and that peace, especially that love that this scripture talks about. And that radiates even if we're in an emotional turmoil. That becomes the predominant vibration in our aura. Even though maybe one day we were all confused and can't figure something out or we're mad something happened, there's a general amazing radiation. I used to work with one woman at East West Bookshop in Palo Alto, Ananda's bookstore there, when I was brand new. And she had been med meditating, you know, I was new, maybe meditating three years or something. She had been meditating for at least 20 by the time I met her. And she had a really strange personality. She was really nitpicky about everything. But 
because her energy was predominantly this meditation energy, when she was nitpicky, it was like, oh, okay, you know, that kind of thing. But it wasn't, it, it was as though her in, the, her, in her old days, you would feel her poking with the nitpickiness. But in her long years of meditation, that nitpicky, nitpickiness was like a shell of personality that really was just the shell. And even though she would nitpick, it wouldn't really permeate through her aura somehow. And I could feel that. I could just feel, I wouldn't say it was cute, but it was okay. It was like she was just being her. And it wasn't always easy to have the nitpick around. But on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, it was really nice to have that long time meditating person around. That was a joy. And we became very good friends, very good friends over the years and, and had a deep connection on many levels. That's what happens when you serve with others because you want to, not because it's required. And, and the people who come, come saying, what can I do? There's not a, we need to have this job, or we need to do this, or we need to have things the way we want it. They come and say, what needs to be done? And the people who are most helpful are the ones that say, how can I help? And they were like, great as opposed to the people that come that say, that needs to be done, and that needs to be done, and that should be done, having no idea all the things that are done. But just, it's my job, you know. So when we're dry as twigs, when that devotion has gone, then we serve. And by connecting with people in service and feeling we're useful <laughs> and just moving, doing whatever it's taking for that service, you can really recharge. You know, healing prayers are a good thing to do also. That helps expand our aura. So the scripture talks about give me all your love, cling to me, but if you're dry, you can't do that <laughs> very well. You can say it. Dear God, I adore you. <sighs> you know? So we have to identify where we are and then work with where we are. Because if you just read this, you think, oh, that's how I need to be. That's way up here. I'm not there. So we start where we are. Get that recharging done. Get back to the place of devotion and love. Just the spiritual path is about constantly getting back to that place, back to the place inside, back to the divine love, back to the re-energization of that connection with the divine. It's a continual thing because there's an entropy that wants to happen, and that's called delusion of the world. It just pulls us away. Be and then we start believing the reality. I really should be afraid. I, there really are horrible things happening. I, you know, and, and suddenly we find ourselves separated from the divine, believing the delusion that we should instead live in worry and fear and agitation because we don't have time. Don't have time to do the meditation. So let's remember to just re-energize when we need to. It's, it's like an SOS. Didn't someone have like some SOS? CPR. C oh, CPR. What was it? Constant process of re-inspiration. Yeah, constant process of re-inspiration. CPR. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so it's a continual process I'm not going to say struggle <laughs> it's just a, a process that's okay 
It's just okay to be up and down and in and out. But as long as our goal is still in the right direction, we get there. We start getting there. And then soon the bliss comes. And once it comes to a certain point, it never goes away. It's always there. And so then Swamiji is saying in the scripture, though, that this whole practice of Kriya and practice of deep devotion to the, to the divine and, and deep meditation should not be um, something we do uh, so we can get away with acting adharmically. You know, he, he said in the readings about, you know, it doesn't mean you can lie, cheat, and steal while you're saying, I'm one with God. It's, it just doesn't work that way. So that's why also when we're feeling that dryness, when we're misbehaving, if we go and start serving, it aligns us because we're with other guru bhais who are also thinking the same way, who are also wanting to be in the divine flow. And so that group magnetism that is here helps put people back in alignment as well. It's a very nice thing to have. What's not nice is when the group is full of um, gossip and uh, bullying, which we've seen. <laughs> so make sure when you come, you behave. Behave when you're here. Don't bully. Don't, don't try and be overly personal with someone you don't really know. Like, I know a secret about you. Who cares? You know? That, do that with your cousins. <laughs> We're not cousins here. You know, everyone here really wants to be their better self, whether they're acting that way or not. So really work on being your, your better self when you, when you walk in the door. You'll feel so much better when you walk out. And when we're mean in gossip, we're hurting our heart. And then your meditation doesn't work. So get rid of that. Pick the gossip out. And don't put your mind there. It's easy to, but there's no need to. Uh, it doesn't help anything. It doesn't change anyone. You know, unless there's peer pressure and it's repeated over and over and over again, which we know about also. <laughs> Just don't be the one who does that. We're meditators now. We don't have to feel so attached to cultural norms. We don't have to be vocal about it. We can quietly do things our own way. There's no need to, you know, wave a flag of independence and rebellion. <laughs> but we may do it in our own little quiet way. And no one knows. No one knows. They don't, uh, the, our inner bliss and happiness is between us and God. No one has to know. But they will know because they'll feel it. So anyway, it's very nice to see you all. And I hope you're doing well. God bless you.